Welcome to another episode of the Doctors Building Wealth podcast. Kenji and I are so excited to have Dr. Gregory Hansen here joining us. He is the co-founder of FlipMD, um, along with his wife, did some really cool things with that company and just, I think, has an incredible entrepreneur story. So we're really excited to invite him and have him here and kind of talk to everyone about being an entrepreneurial doctor and taking something and being able to sell it, sell a company. So welcome, um, Gregory. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Greg is fine. We don't, yeah, Greg's great. <laughs> yeah, I can go uh, kind of into my background quickly and then, you know, jump into a little bit of the story about how we started the company and then go from there. So um, from California originally, went to UCLA for undergrad and then moved out to the East Coast after that, um, which was, you know, kind of at the tail end of the last kind of recession that we had 2010. Um, so ended up not finding anything that I could do after um, undergrad. So ended up moving to New York City and did a lot of odd jobs from like working a kid's summer camp, like sports camp to working at Nordstrom Rack in the women's dress section for a couple of years. Um, and then ended up uh, applying to and getting into Columbia for my MPH in epidemiology and applied biostatistics. Did that for two years, did a bunch of research, um, continued doing a bunch of kind of odd jobs. There was one time where I was sampling the air on the subway for uh, one of the professors there who actually became quite a big name in like the COVID research. Um, and then after Columbia, um, actually in New York is when I met my wife, Lauren. Um, so she'll be part of the story as we go. Um, then ended up moving up to New Hampshire for med school, went to Dartmouth for um, med school and uh, loved it. Did a lot of skiing, got a German Shepherd and kind of lived the New Hampshire life. Uh, the wife wanted to come back to civilization and ended up applying into both interventional and diagnostic radiology programs and ended up getting into the IR program at Jefferson in Philly. So we moved to Philadelphia back in 2018. Um, with our daughter at the time. So we had a daughter at the end of med school um, who also will come into the story. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, ended up doing a surgical intern year there at Jeff and learned how to work really, really hard and not complain. Um, and then we kind of shifted over to the diagnostic year. So I went from working 80 hours a week down to 40, 45, which is amazing. Um, but at the same time, my Only daughter was doctor starting- would say that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, at the same time, I kind of transitioned over to the less hours, though my oldest daughter, Nora, started school. So she started going to um, a little preschool in Philadelphia, which cost you know, 1200 bucks or whatever it was. We just didn't really have the money to do it. Um, so we were kind of tapped out after buying a house in South Philadelphia. So needed to figure out another way to make a little extra money on the side. Um, so I ended up going on to Upwork, which is just kind of like a freelancing platform and used both the MD and the MPH to get random jobs on there and went from charging like $35 an hour up to 250 an hour and ended up making like, I think 35 or 40,000 in like a span of like eight or nine months. And, you know, that was, that was a nice kind of load taken off of, you know, the financial piece because couldn't moonlight, moonlight at the time clinically. So needed to figure out that to kind of at least make men ends meet. Um, so yeah, did that. And then basically the story of FlipMD comes about from that. Um, so we ended up going, this is like middle of pandemic. So July, 2020, June, 2020, whatever it was, we went to Northern Georgia and went to a cabin. And basically on the way back, it's like a 12 hour drive. Lauren and I were talking and we're like, well, we have this little you know, nest egg for us, right? Of like 10 or $15,000 that we had saved up. We're like, what do we want to do with it? It's the middle of the pandemic. Um, and honestly, the thing that we were thinking of doing was buying an RV. And so we just go around and camp when we wanted to and get out of the city um, or start this company. So we had the idea for FlipMD really from the work that I was doing on Upwork and realizing that, hey, there's no like physician focused freelancing platform. Um, and it just kept kind of coming back to me over and over again. I was like, this is, seems like an okay idea. Um, no entrepreneurial spirit in me before this, there was no business side of things for me. Um, but it just kept coming back, coming back. And I was like, we should just try it see what happens. Um, so we spent that like 15,000 and built a crappy little platform, um, and posted it anywhere I could on Facebook for groups that would let me. Um, and we ended up building a little bit of an audience and then got some jobs on there and then it kind of grew from there. Um, but that's the basic least story of how it came about. Um, but yeah, super random. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how literally all those jobs, those odd jobs you were working all those years really just seemed like it was training in a way. 
for you to be in this environment where you're creating a space for people to come and look for all these different jobs that they can do on the side. I wonder how you, um, how did you deal with the fact and the thought of working full-time plus taking something else on? Because a lot of people in our community, they're working full-time as docs, and then they're thinking about taking on real estate investing. And one of the co most common beliefs we hear is, oh, I just don't have enough time. So can you talk to me about how you justified that or thought through that as a couple? Yeah, it was kind of a unique situation. So going through the pandemic as like a diagnostic radiologist, um, they basically were staggering our schedule. So we we're doing like a week on week off, um, sometimes two weeks on two weeks off. Um, and so there was a lot of downtime where you probably should be studying. Um, but I did study a little bit, but also started working on the business. So had it not been for the pandemic, I don't think this actually would have happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was kind of the beginning of the company was, you know, we were doing this week on week off. So I could do a fair amount of work on the side on the company. Um, and it ended up, you know, growing from that. And then, you know, after three or four months, we were back in the hospital, basically full time. Then it was really more of like, how do I actually do this? Um, and so it was a very part-time thing for us. Like I was maybe working 10 to 15 hours a week at like the most um, throughout the majority of like the company's life cycle. Um, and at the same time, in my head, it was basically like, how do I do well enough at my job as a diagnostic radiologist at that time so that people don't know that I'm doing anything else on the side? So basically, it was like my program director knew um, and a couple other attendings in the department knew and some of the residents knew. Uh, but otherwise, it was basically a secret. Um, and so my whole point was like, can I, you know, not get in trouble? Or is anybody not going to be like, hey, you need to go study more kind of thing. Um, and I was able to pull that off where, you know, I hadn't really lost too much of like the diagnostic skills by doing something part time. And so I just kept doing it. Um, and I guess that's like a lesson to learn is like, you know, you, you will find time if it's something that you really want to do. And I would take meetings like sales calls, um, you know, at lunch when I was supposed to be in conference or listening to conference over Zoom, because again, it wasn't in person at the time. Um, so I would take like 15, 20 minute calls and then, you know, listen to the rest of the lecture. But yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was basically like, how can I do this with enough hours for it to continue to grow um, without sacrificing basically the rest of my career if it failed, which most startups end up do failing. Um, so that was kind of the hard part. Tell me about that growth. I'm curious, uh, what was the speed of growth? At what point did it get to be, did it get to impacting your clinical career, right? Uh, when did it start to become all consuming? Never really, to be honest. Um, so it never became all consuming. Um, it was more like it was growing at a fast enough clip that, so the way that we grew the platform for anybody else that's like, hey, how do you grow a marketplace, which is like a specific type of kind of startup that you can start you have the two sides, right? So you have the physicians and the companies um, and you have to figure out how do you balance the growth of both of those sides? Because if you grow the company side way too quickly and you have no physicians to take the job, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. If you have too many physicians and not enough jobs, it's not going to work. Um, and so it was a really delicate balance. And so the way that we did it was basically like we said, okay, we're every time we get a new job into the platform, I'm going to find, you know, 10 or 20 of those specific physicians to come into the platform, um, create a profile and apply to it. So you know, we got a lot of orthopedic jobs early on. So um, we ended up getting like 150 or 200 orthopedic surgeons on the platform pretty quickly. So that's kind of how we grew it. Um, and so it wasn't like all consuming. It was basically like when something came up, I would LinkedIn outreach to people and be like, hey, do you guys want to make 500 bucks, 1500 bucks, like whatever the project was. Um, and usually the projects were super easy, um, at least early on. Like I remember we had one orthopedic surgeon that was traveling between hospitals and like got paid 500 bucks for just giving his basically thoughts around a procedure. Um, and so like a lot of them were pretty low touch in terms of like what needed to be done. So it was relatively easy to get people into the platform to take those. Um, and we really tried to focus on also like finding things that were relatively high pain and not like, you know, crappy pay that physicians are going to be like, that's not worth my time. Um, which a lot of the jobs that we came across were going to be kind of worthless. So we just didn't really put them on the platform. Um, yeah. That's a huge differentiator, yeah, I think, yeah, but yeah. Uh, compared to what a lot of other sites and groups do. What about uh, your wife, Lauren? Was she uh, also involved in the business? Was she full-time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so also pandemic, um, school shut down. So we had our daughter at home who was two and a half at the time we started the company. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, she was basically the CEO of the company. She was the primary person day in and day out that was doing the work. Um, overall, she was probably working maybe five or 10 more hours than I was because she was at home, but she was working in the mornings during naps um, at night when I got home. And so there's a funny video that she has on her phone of uh, our daughter jumping up and down on the couch, like watching Toy Story 2 while she's on her computer and basically being like, this is startup life in the pandemic. Um, so yeah, she was extremely vital to the company. She's still at GoodRx. Actually, we haven't even talked about that yet. But um, yeah, I mean, without her, this never would have happened. She's much more of the business minded person. So she was the kid that had like, you know, a jewelry store growing up with a website and like actually sold stuff um, at like 11 years old. Um, and so she brought a lot of that kind of like business grit and understanding. Um, so yeah, there's no way this would have worked without that. I also don't think it would have worked with any other co-founder either, which is really interesting. Like that's another lesson to learn. Like if you're a physician thinking about starting a company, um, if you're doing it with your spouse, VCs will look down on that and be like, well, that's that's a huge risk for us. If you guys get a divorce, what the hell is going to happen to the company? Um, but actually, I think it was probably our greatest like superpower because literally you're with that person, you know, whenever you're home. Um, and so, you know, going to sleep at night, it was like, hey, what can we do? What does this logo look like? Like there was always conversations to be had about the company, um, which is also nice for your relationship. I'm sure you guys kind of experienced that as well, where it's like, you're not just talking about your kids. You're not just talking about whatever, but you actually have like really interesting things that you can talk about that will eventually make a difference in your life, hopefully um, outside of your kids. I mean, kids are great, but it's also nice to have something else with your spouse. Yeah, how was it uh, working with your wife? Uh, was it were there some rough moments? Uh, were there some stressful moments? Uh, or was it all smooth sailing? Of course. There was a couple <laughs> stressful moments, but honestly, overall, it was it was pretty smooth. Um, I don't know why, but it it was relatively smooth. I think we both had our strengths within the company and both had our weaknesses, and so we honestly didn't overlap that much in terms of like. You know, I didn't have to wait for her. She didn't have to wait for me with how we were building it out. Um, so it honestly went a lot better than I anticipated going in. And it probably strengthened our relationship quite a bit just because it's like you are literally like in a bunker together against the rest of the world trying to figure out how to make this thing not die. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun and it was a great experience for us. I wouldn't recommend it for everybody. Like if you, you know, give it a shot, but. It, I don't think it's always going to work out if it's a, a couple doing something together. But again, I think for us, it was probably the only reason that I succeeded was because it was my wife and I, Lauren. So yeah. now one, one unique thing I saw about what you guys have done is within a couple years, I mean, you grew from just a tiny little startup to being bought by GoodRx. So can you talk to us about what led to that? what you think the differentiators are that somebody, you know, who wants to follow in that path and says, you know, one of my things is I want to build a business and be bought out by a giant one. What would you suggest doing? Yeah. So the story goes back to September of 2021. Um, I was pitching an investment banking firm to use the services basically to find physicians to help them with whatever decisions they have to make. Um, like halfway through, they started asking like really weird questions about like how the growth of the platform is going, like revenue numbers and stuff like that. And I was like, what is happening? Um, and they're like, yeah, we actually have a couple of companies that might be interested in acquiring your company. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so going in, like we did not expect to sell that quickly. Um, usually startups take anywhere from like five to 10 years to actually exit, this was literally like 18 months. Um, and so, yeah, we got that acquisition interest and I was a PGY, oh God, what was I? PGY three, four, I was a PGY four at the time. And I was like, okay, well, we might as well figure out like, is there actual interest? Um, so ended up then meeting with that company and basically in that first meeting, they're like, yeah, we're super interested in acquiring this, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I'm not going to go in with just like one offer if they actually do put an offer in. Um, so I ran something called a process, which is the M and a process. So mergers and acquisitions, um, something that again, I hadn't actually studied up on. So I will say that like, when we started a company, like I literally jumped full in and learned everything about startups, everything about financing startups. Um, but I hadn't gotten to exits yet. And so I basically did a deep dive into like YouTube podcasts, books, all about how does M and a actually work on the corporate side of things. 
um, and basically created a list of like 15 companies that I ultimately reached out to, specifically their corp dev departments, um, which run M&A for them, and reached out to a bunch of like both public and private companies, basically anybody that I thought would want something like this to kind of tuck in and, and see kind of how it grows with, within that bigger company. Um, so we did that process from September until November of that year and ended up getting two offers literally within three hours of each other on the same day. Um, and so we then kind of negotiated against both using the leverage from the two offers. Um, one was from GoodRx, so who we ultimately sold to, and then another was a private company, which I won't say exactly who that was. Um, but yeah, we basically got the two offers and then just kind of created a negotiating bidding process and ended up going from like the original um, bid and basically doubled it and they accepted it. We're like, okay. <laughs> um, which then created like an interesting kind of like decision point for me in my career, which, um, you know, basically when I talked to, I ended up talking to a bunch of attendings. I was like, what would you guys do if you had this like opportunity on your plate, knowing that I still loved medicine? Like I still loved doing procedures. I was about to get into my interventional radiology years. Um, so I was going to finish my diagnostic years and like the, my friend that was also going through it, he was my IR co-resident. Like it would have been so much fun, like actually being in the procedure room with him. But then it's like, you weigh that against, holy crap, I can actually exit my career with about the same amount of earnings I would have gotten from like a 30 or 35 year career all up front in one fell swoop. And now I get to hang out with my kids. Now I actually get to see them grow up and, you know, we get to do all of these other things that I never thought I would be able to. Um, that was kind of like, it, it made total sense to just go with it. Um, so I ended up talking to like five or six different attendings and they all said, leave. I was like, okay, <laughs> uh, I'll take your advice. Um, so yeah, we ended up taking that GoodRx offer and became a employee at GoodRx and didn't last very long. Uh, I got bored really quickly, but I don't know if you guys want to go into that. Um, but yeah, that's how we kind of got the acquisition offers. And um, it's honestly like, it's, it's difficult, um, but it was also great timing for us. That's the last thing I'll say. Um, it was at the height of the market. It hadn't collapsed yet. Like had we waited three or six months, there's no way we would have exited um, at that point. We would have had to wait until the market corrected and, um, multiples went back up, but yeah, it's, it was literally perfect timing for us. Um, and I remember like two weeks after the acquisition or like a week I was putting my daughter down. We had our second kid, um, halfway through kind of building this company. And I went back to the bed after putting her down and it was like, uh, Russia invades Ukraine on CNN. And I was like, Holy crap. And that's when the market literally just tanked after that. And I was like, well, I'm glad all this went down before this. Um, so yeah, it was great timing. Wow. Incredible. So one thing I heard you say is that you guys went out and found these other offers. Did you not use a broker and you did this yourself? This is so cool. So I've never met anyone who hasn't used a broker. So tell me about this experience. And is it something you would suggest other people do? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we had conversations with brokers, like when we maybe six months into the company, um, and I was like, oh, how do you guys like make money? And he's like, well, we make money on your acquisition. I was like, no. Um, because that ends up being a crap ton of money when you think about it. And honestly, it was like, I think that I can figure out how to do this on our own. Um, and it's really not that hard. Like it literally took sending emails to corp dev people at different companies. So as long as you can figure out who are the companies that ultimately will want to buy something that you're building, create the relationship. And honestly, like the thing that I would have done differently is like, probably created those relationships even earlier on just so people knew who you were. Um, because then if like you do get acquisition interest, it's a lot easier to send a quick email to somebody that you're already friendly with and be like, Hey, we actually got an offer. Are you guys interested in putting one in too? Uh, but no, I don't, you don't need a broker. Um, I mean, unless you're like a gigantic company that maybe they can optimize the actual like cash or stock percentage of it. I don't think it's worth it. Um, I'm glad we didn't do it. And that's another thing, actually. So what we didn't talk about is like, we didn't take that much capital overall from like VCs or angel investors. We took kind of what we needed um, to get, it's like an ant on me. Um, 
we took like 160,000 bucks. Um, so basically at the end of the acquisition or at the end of the company, we owned like 97.6% of it, um, which is huge. Like our acquisition was not gigantic um, in comparison to like Silicon Valley, where you hear about like billions of dollars. Um, but it was life-changing for us because we hadn't given a chunk of it away to anybody. Um, so that's like another lesson is like, if you can build and bootstrap, do it that way. Don't just like, give 20 or 30% of your company away, unless you need it, unless you're building like a device company or a hardware company where you need like hundreds of millions of dollars to make, make it successful. I would be cautious in how much you give away. So tell us about what you're doing now. Cause I know you kind of left good RX, but we were just talking about real estate. So tell us where mm-hmm. real estate fits all into this. Yeah, I'm doing a few things now. Um, so yeah, I left good RX back in September. So eight months after the acquisition, um, again, got really bored. So I just, I was out, um, Lauren's still there. We'll see for how long. Um, and so, yeah, basically immediately after the acquisition, um, you know, you fall into a ton of money that you've never had before. Um, so you figure out what you're going to do with that. We paid off all our debts basically, and then started diversifying our portfolio. So we did some stocks, um, you know, a fair amount in the brokerage account, and then, um, wanted to figure out what else we wanted to do with it. So, ended up getting into the short-term rental game. Um, so we ended up buying, well, we bought this place, which is behind me, um, which we use as basically like a vacation home for ourselves, going back and forth between Philly and and the weekend up here in New York. Um, and then we were like, well, let's look in the New York area since that's where we're ultimately going to move to. And so we started looking with a realtor that helped us get this place and found a place in the Catskills, um, which we bought in... July of 2022. So like three or four months after the acquisition. Um, it's like a seven or eight bedroom, seven bedroom place um, with quite a few baths and it has a pool. Um, so that's kind of the the big differentiator within the cat skills is like having the pool is huge. Um, so yeah, it ended up going well. The first kind of from August when we started renting it to December 31st, um, I think it did like 55K in gross bookings. And then this year it's on track for the calendar year for like 230, 240, um, which is great. Um, And so, yeah, we ended up getting another place in the Adirondacks, which we're getting up and running as we speak. We actually have one of our friends going up there right now to do a a little bit of work on it. Um, But it's a similar setup in terms of like the number of bedrooms and it has a gigantic pool. It's like a 60 foot by 30 foot pool. It's huge. Um, It's a lot of water (laughs) and a lot of heating. Um, and that one's like in the middle of the woods on a lake. Um, it'll be pretty cool, but who knows what that'll do. Cause it's a little bit further up, but it's nice. Um, I would say if like you guys are in the New York area, anybody listening, like it's actually a pretty good place. I think to do STRs mostly because you have Manhattan to pull from and like everything around Manhattan, like the Catskill house is only like a two and a half hour drive outside of Manhattan. The Adirondack one is less than four. Um, having that gigantic Metro to pull from is huge. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's worked quite well so far. We'll see if it continues doing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we got into the short-term rental stuff, mostly just to kind of diversify our own portfolio. And then like we talked about before coming on, there's a lot of tax advantages with uh, short-term rentals. And so we took advantage of those and we will continue taking advantage of them. Um, I wish the bonus depreciation thing wasn't going down to 80% this year, but it's 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 a good thing how uh, Rentals are crazy when you think about all the advantages with those. And we also do a lot of investing on the side into startups as well. So that's kind of how we diversified was stocks, real estate, and then angel investments. Amazing. You you had mentioned uh, Europe uh, before we uh, got on. Uh, What are your plans uh, in terms of going to Europe? Yeah. So this is like a it's a half picked plan so far, but the idea is, so we're moving up to New York full time for our daughters to start going to school up here. Um, so we'll be in this house for the school year. And then the thought is, can we basically rent this place out in the summer to then go to Europe, basically, hopefully for free and have it kind of just cancel each other out. Um, or maybe we'll make a little money on the side from it as well. Um, so that's the thought right now is like, can we get to Europe every summer for you know, two months or whatever it is, um, which would be amazing because, you know, it would make being up here for my wife probably a little bit easier because this is like also a little bit in the middle of nowhere. Um, So getting back into like her comfort zone of having stuff to do would be nice. Um, (laughs) So we'll see. It might help us stay a little bit longer than, you know, going back to a city in the next couple of years. But yeah, 
And then yeah. otherwise, uh, I guess the other thing I'll say is like getting into your guys' world a little bit. Um, so started a podcast myself um, and that was a month and a half ago. Um, so it's all about kind of anything that I'm interested in, which is tech, news, angel investing, a tiny bit of kind of personal finance and a tiny bit of rentals and stuff like that. Um, and so we're basically doing a daily podcast um, because I have the time and me and my buddy just kind of want to do it and see what happens and go from there. Um, But really like the goal is to kind of teach other physicians about startup building and startup investing and kind of just open up that lane a little bit more to people that might have ideas and don't really know how to track them down or what to do with them. Um, So if you are out there, you would like to listen to that. It's the Physician Syndicate podcast. And if you have a company you want to start, please reach out to me. I would love to hear what the idea is and potentially put a check in. <laughs> just throw that out there for the deal love flow. It. Love it. Awesome. We're going to turn into an accelerator program, which is yeah. very cool, right? I That is one of the ideas is not to be an accelerator, to be an incubator instead. Um, so to bring physicians in, give them like a 25 or 50K check and help them build the company out and eventually go out and raise more money. Um, that is kind of one of the potential ideas for where we're going with this is to really just to help back other physicians. Like there are a lot of physician founders that do really well. Um, I just don't think many people are aware that actually happens. Um, Like the Hippocrates founder went on to do one medical and then now Galileo, like that guy is just killing it, Tom Lee. Um, There's plenty of founders though that are physicians that have done amazing things. And I think it's honestly like a superpower, right? It's like, you've lived all of the problems. Now you just have to go figure out which one do I want to solve? So. Yeah, amazing. And little did you know, you were talking to people who are looking for a short-term rental in Italy. Uh Uh, You can accelerate depreciation and, uh, and are going to spend, we're going to spending, I guess, two and a half months in Europe this summer. And we actually found a program where they actually do school and there's a co-working space with other entrepreneurs and they give you an apartment. So uh, we'll tell you about it after. What that's, that? that's what we're doing for six weeks in Syros, Greece this summer. Oh, and that's awesome. We've already, with a group of, I guess, six physician families, we're already taking over a lot of Syros, Greece next year in 2024 too. So we're just moving Dude, that's to the community cool. and living abroad and putting our kids in school and, and living this kind of like that you're imagining in part-time Europe. So. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. So I was actually looking into like the golden visa situation. And then I was like doing more research and I was like, you can be there up to 90 days. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, we'll just do the summers basically and not have to invest, you know, 500,000 or have to a worry. million bucks. Yeah. And I mean, Portugal is, is the taxes are much better, but like in Italy, for example, where we actually hold citizenship, we don't want to be citizens, right? We want the Puerto Rican tax savings, but Puerto Rico is so great. Because you can be here part of the year, but then you can be other places and you can be in, you know, Italy for 90 days at a time and go over to Croatia or whatever. Go back. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So we ask all of our guests uh, two questions. The first one is, what is your definition of wealthy? Yeah, I think the definition of wealthy for me has changed a little bit from, you know, a year ago to now. I would say the definition for me is someone that can kind of do what they want to do without having to necessarily like think through what are the ramifications if I don't do something else. Um, So that's kind of my definition is just the ability to kind of float through life a little bit and kind of just do what you want to do rather than what you have to do would be kind of my definition. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I think that would be it. What is one mindset, habit, or strategy that separates someone who is wealthy versus someone who is not? I think it's somebody that's kind of like, it'll go back to like the the typical medical trait, like the lifelong learner. I think that's a huge thing. Um, so we actually did a podcast on the buy, borrow, die strategy, which I'm sure you guys are aware of. And it, it came about because I was looking on like the white coat investor Facebook group. And this, this person was asking about having to pay for whatever expense it was and like, you know, selling their stock to do it. And I was like, why, why would you do that? <laughs> um, so I think like the lifelong learner is kind of what I would say, just because, you know, when you're in situations, you can always figure out creative solutions. If you're willing to kind of go read, go listen to things um, and that's how I came through the strategy of like the buy, bar, die thing, which is insane when you think about it. Like you're basically not, you're selling your stock, but not really selling your stock and there's no tax hit on it. And you actually have a tax advantage because you're basically paying back interest. 
you never have to pay the whole thing back. Like those are the kind of things that, you know, super rich, super wealthy people know how to do. Like Jeff Bezos, when he buys his yacht, doesn't sell Amazon stock. He just borrows against it. Um, so I think the lifelong learning thing is definitely the thing that I would say, just because anybody can learn all of these different things. They just have to be willing to kind of go look for them and be curious. Um, yeah, I, I guess that would be the answer. And execute. For me. And execute, right? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. That's another thing we talk about too, is like, you know, ideas are cheap um, if you're not going to go out and actually do something about it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for being on this podcast and everyone, you should definitely go listen to his podcast. Um, I'm sure there are so many ideas, especially if you want to learn to start your own business and grow your own business. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.